And if you want to make more money, you're in the right place because you're learning how to create more value out there in the world. And the more value you create, the more dollars you make. So if you want to make money, what do you got to do? Create value. How do you create more value? That's the question I want you to continually ask yourself. You do it through serving people, through impacting people, through solving problems. And as you serve others, there's this awesome thing called the internet that you get a leverage that means that you don't, it's so much more reach than we had in the past, right? Hey, there's some, some really good news I want to start with, which is that 91% of people in the world that are worth $5 million or more, have one thing in common. They own a business. So the good news about this is this is going to be about personal finance for business owners, but this is more intentionally going to be about how you generate more cash flow without having to work harder, without having to take more risk, without having to cut back, because I want to look at your existing assets and the existing things that you have as potential that's latent, that's not producing for you and give you things you could implement within 24 hours or probably not 24 hours because there'll be other speakers, but by Monday to improve your cash flow and generate more cash flow. And in addition to that, make sure you're capturing more wealth along the way with your business. Is, all right. Okay. Okay. So the, good, the other piece of good news is even though I'm in finance, we're not going to be talking like very dry about economics and we're not going to like I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of statistics and convince you to separate yourself from your money to put it into some investment that you don't know that you don't control in the name of some commission anyone ever experienced that in the world of finance see when you're a business owner that is the kind of information that could damage you and actually hurt you when it comes to your finances is to separate yourself from your money and to invest in things that you don't know. I mean, you now have this opportunity. You own a business to invest in yourself and to really gamble on yourself instead of on the gambling that happens out there in the investing world. At least if you're in Vegas and you're going to gamble, they'll bring you cocktails and you can play a card game along the way, right? So <laughs> I, I, in the introduction, they talked about, you know, I've been a lifelong entrepreneur. Well, my first official business was when I was 15 years old. And nothing like too sexy or savvy. It was detailing cars, which was, you know, scrubbing bugs and tar off of cars and waxing and that kind of stuff. But I became a speaker pretty quickly because six months in that business, I was presenting on owning a business to this panel called SIFE, Students in Free Enterprise. And I won $500 for an hour speech, and I thought about how many damn cars I'd have to detail in order to make $500. And that's why I'm here today speaking instead of washing cars, all right? <laughs> so this is the opportunity before you. I, I don't know how many people in here come for money. I didn't come for money. My parents, my dad's a coal miner. My mom worked at a credit union. And my great-grandfathers and grandfathers were all coal miners. So the one thing that they taught me that I think was a good lesson, but it's not enough to get you wealthy and keep you wealthy, was they taught me to work hard. And that's important, right? I think we can agree with that. But at the same time, hard work with the wrong financial philosophy equals bankruptcy, equals devastating results, equals bitterness and frustration. Because imagine, if you're putting your whole heart and your entire passion into everything that you're doing, and you're doing everything to execute and implement, and then all of a sudden there's a financial surprise that comes your way, and you get completely derailed because you didn't have the right financial situation, you didn't have the right liquidity and safety, then what? See, that's the part that's missing. So I want to give you the insights and the tips, and I'm going to talk about the first thing, called cash flow banking, which is an infrastructure for you to capture wealth elegantly rather than to budget. Who would like to never budget for the rest of their life? Yeah. I have a book coming out next year called Budgeting Sucks. All right. Live free, retire wealthy. And I'll just make a declaration I haven't made yet, but I'm going to declare it to this room for the first time. I'm going to make that the number one financial book of the next decade. See, 22, uh, the, I was like number 22 in the last decade with Killing Sacred Cows when I didn't know what the heck I was doing. You know, I was just putting a book out there and then it, it caught traction. But I'm going to make sure budgeting sucks gets in people's hands because budgeting actually creates a scarcity mindset. And you have to use all this mental energy and anguish and time to go out there and budget. And then you set up different envelopes or jars and you put different amounts of money in there. And if there's not enough money, then I guess you just don't get to do something that month. But that actually limits someone. And scarcity is the greatest destroyer of wealth that's out there. No amount of luck, 
no amount of saving, no discipline, no rate of return, no financial advisor will ever save you if you're in the scarcity mindset because the scarcity mindset propagates what I call the consumer condition. And the consumer condition is where people look to take more from the world than they give. And that always leads to financial disaster. And no matter how much money they have, they always feel like they're going to lose it and they never truly enjoy it. So the first thing is you are your asset. You're the greatest asset. It's not a stock. It's not a bond. It's not a piece of real estate. It's your mindset and it's your ability to create value. And if you want to make more money, you're in the right place because you're learning how to create more value out there in the world. And the more value you create, the more dollars you make. So if you want to make money, what do you got to do? Create value. How do you create more value? That's the question I want you to continually ask yourself. You do it through serving people, through impacting people, through solving problems. And as you serve others, there's this awesome thing called the internet that you get a leverage that means that you don't, it's so much more reach than we had in the past, right? So you're in this unique time, this unique opportunity, and you don't have to budget anymore. On the other hand, different than scarcity is abundance, which I call the producer paradigm. And the producer paradigm is where you look to create more value in the world than you take from it, right? That's where wealth comes from. See, people in scarcity think if someone's profitable or someone makes a lot of money, where do they think that came from? from they, it's been taken. It's evidence of deception. It's evidence of coercion. It's evidence of someone else making, you know, taking too much of the pie. But the reality is all wealth is built through exchange. See, if I give you a dollar, that's not the end of that dollar. You could take and use that dollar again, right? And then whoever you give the dollar to, they get to use it again. So the more time that circulates out there through goods, services, and experiences, the more wealth that's built, not the less. See, the government just can't print money and expect there to be more wealth because there has to be exchange behind that. So you're out there to help facilitate exchange, get things in people's hands that they value. I looked at that list that Jason put up there, right? That gave them confidence, that gave them assurance, that solved the problem for them, all those kinds of things. So that's the real key to wealth. And yet if we go to most of personal finance, it's directly in opposition to that. Isn't it usually about cutting back, saving, sacrificing, delaying, deferring, so that one day, someday, you can finally live the good life? Anyone ever been sold that bill of goods before? That sucks, right? I'm just going to keep using that word. Budgeting sucks. That philosophy sucks. You know, that's no good. You know what I'm saying? So <clears throat> it's just kind of weird when the camera just like comes up, you know? Like, hey, what's up? So, <laughs> so when I started at 15 with my first business, uniquely named Garrett Gunderson's Car Care. Yep. And I'm detailing these cars and then I start hiring some employees and then I become the Young Entrepreneur of the Year for the Small Business Administration, and I win $5,000, and I'm a teenager with $5,000. What do you think I'm going to do with it? Yeah, I was a financial nerd. I was a nerd, I guess. I wanted to invest that money. You know, I was in this small coal mining town of Price, and I figured if I could invest that money and become a millionaire, that that meant I was something, that I wasn't this little small town nothing. Anyone ever felt that before? Like, that takes me way back and I'll share because, you know, all of you chose to be an entrepreneur because you're unique. There's something different about you. You, you said that you were going to invest in yourself or take a gamble on you instead of putting your money into other things that you don't control and you don't know anything about the outcome. And if you read Walt Disney's biography, Pretty Long Thing, there's a letter inside of that bi biography from Roy, from his brother. And it was during the Depression. And he had written home to his parents and said, hey, I think that everyone's going to learn a pretty big lesson, that they think that they're investing, but they're actually gambling. Walt and I decided to take a gamble on ourselves and build a studio because it's something that we have control over. It's something that we have a vision for. And then look what happened, right? So I, you have this opportunity to stay in charge, to be at the forefront of it. But when I was in kindergarten, how about this? We'll go back to kindergarten to talk about why I was this money nerd. And why, instead of going out there and blowing that money and spending it and buying something like, I grew up in Price, so maybe buying like a, a, a lifted truck with a gun rack or something like that, you know, in this little coal mining town. Instead, I wanted to invest it. And by the way, when I went to ask where I should invest, the first person I went to was the president of the credit union because I detailed their cars that they repossessed. Anyone have a guess where they told me to invest that money? Yeah, certificate of deposit. How exciting is that, by the way? Certificate of deposit, rule of 72, you just take the interest rate, which is like 0.01%, you know, some ridiculously low thing into 72. It tells you how long it takes the money to double. I was young. I'm like, I, will I even be alive that long? You know, 
It's like, that's longer than I've been alive at this point. So a CD sounded awful. But then I did what a lot of people do. I said, well, who do I know that has a lot of money? And I went to my uncle. And my uncle, he had a lot of money. He had a really big home. So I thought that meant you had a lot of money. Now, for some people, it means they're on the brink of bankruptcy. But for him, he actually made a lot of money. So I went and said, where should I invest? And he said, Novell. Who's heard of Novell? At the time, they owned 87% of the traffic of the internet, and now there's like seven people in the room that know who Nobel is. So if I would have invested in Nobel, what would have happened to my money, right? That 5,000 would have went away pretty quickly. So fortunately, my aunt pulled me aside. She said, your uncle makes a lot of money in business and then pisses it away in the stock market, right? <laughs> and you know the best way to end up with a million dollars in the stock market. You start with two million or more, right? Like, that's just the problem with this whole thing. And then they tell you that on average, it's earned 10% since 2000 BC. You know, it's like average. Like, let's say today I get in my little Venetian hotel and there's, there's two shower heads and I turn one to cold and the other one to scalding hot. On average, I'm at a warm temperature, but in reality, I'm miserable as hell, right? It doesn't really work that way. That's not how the world works. I mean, let me, let's just do simple math. Let's say that you have $10,000 and you're in 100% on it. Who knows what that grows to? 20,000, right? Now, if you lose 50% the next year, now what is it? Back to your 10,000. So that's a 0% actual return, right? Actual return. Worse than that because they took their damn fees no matter what. But it's a 0% actual return. But anyone know how to just do quick average, averages like math, right? So if we had 100% the first year, Philip, we subtract 50% the second year, that's a positive 50%, right? Over two years, divide it by two, that's a 25% average return. This is why no one's getting ahead in the stock market, it's all a bunch of crap. We did research. Since 2000, the US stock market, adjusted for inflation, has only done 9%. Total, not per year, total. You have this unique advantage where you could really go in and invest in yourself, build a business. Don't separate the money from your business. Invest in your inventory. Invest in your liquidity. Put it into you. At least if you make some mistakes, which I guarantee anyone in here ever made a mistake in business or just me up here, you know, you'll make mistakes, but at least you could learn from those mistakes and course correct. You can, you use that, that's a tuition, you know, try to learn as much as you can so the tuitions are less expensive. You know, paying for ASM is a lot less expensive than trying to do all this stuff on your own and just getting all beat up all over the place, right? So I really acknowledge that you're here and investing the time in yourself. There's a lot of people that could have, you know, had plenty of excuses, but you found a way to be here. So back to this story, I'm sitting there talking to, you know, how do I find these people that are good at investing? And the more people I ask, the more confusing it becomes. I go talk to a mutual fund salesman and you'll, you'll be surprised what they told me to buy. A mutual fund, how crazy is that? That's how they get paid. And so no matter how, you know, how many questions I asked, I, kept, I didn't really get the good answers. And the real reason, though, that I wanted to become a millionaire, like that was the goal when I was a teenager, not knowing what that really meant, was because, let's go back, you might not, you might not think that I know where I'm going here because I'm going back to the kindergarten story. Remember I said kindergarten earlier? You're like, why did they say kindergarten? You can find out right now. When I was in kindergarten, I made the most beautiful milk carton house. We got to drink chocolate milk, and then when you're finished, you get to do this craft project and turn it into a house. And I thought this was the most lovely art project I had ever done in my life. I was so damn proud, I couldn't wait to take it home to my mom. But then the teacher did this thing where she put it up on a shelf and she said, memorize your address, and once you memorize your address, we'll give you back your milk carton project that you can take to your mom or dad or whatever they said, right? And I'm like, Cool, yeah, I'm gonna do that. But then I went home and played football in the snow or whatever, totally forgot about it. So the second day I show up, half the students get it back, not me because I didn't even think about learning my address. So I was really determined the second day, so I stood on that like fake green, like crappy, like hard stuff you wipe your feet on before you walk into a house. You ever see like, I don't know what the hell that is, but we had that. What's it called? AstroTurf kind of stuff. And I'm just staring in the freezing cold. And then it was just too cold, so I stopped looking at the numbers. I miss it the second day. So now, after missing it the second day, I'm the only kid that hasn't got their milk carton back. And so the third day, I was so determined, but I transposed numbers, and this teacher, instead of handing me back my beautiful little milk carton project, threw it in the garbage. 
I really wanted you to feel bad for me, and you guys just did. But see, in that moment, I said to myself, I am stupid. That's what I believed about myself. And so here's the thing. That fueled me to be a damn entrepreneur because that's why I want to be a millionaire to prove that I wasn't stupid. Right? So I just... But then I realized it was stupid to even worry about this milk carton thing, right? <laughs> but, you know, when you're standing there and the whole class is watching, you're like, oh, shit. And then when I become a public speaker after being, you know, frightened after the, having the whole class watch me. But, but still, sometimes we have whatever drives us to get us there. That's why I wanted to be a millionaire. That's why I wanted to invest my money rather than just go and spend it. And in that journey... You know, here's what's good for you. I decided to just make quick mistakes. Most financial people make a mistake and spend 30 years defending it. Oh, the market's on sale. Oh, you're in it for the long haul. Or dollar cost average. Instead, I said, you know, what is it that I could do instead of having people just separate themselves from their money that would help them out immediately? And I decided I'm going to spend my time with entrepreneurs. And just one more quick story to, to say why, and then I'm going to get into the meat of what you can do to implement and generate more cash with your existing assets. I have to set the table, though. The next thing that really happened was when I was 20, so when I was 19, I started being a financial planner, a.k.a. life insurance and mutual fund salesman, because that's, I just wanted to say financial planner because it sounded a lot better at the time. And in 98 and 99, people thought I was brilliant in my little hometown. I was like the Doogie Hauser in finance, right? Remember Doogie Hauser, the, the boy genius doctor? I was that in finance because everyone was. The market just went up in 98 and 99. So I had them cash in all their investments and put them in with me, move their money from really safe places into really risky places that so they thought, this is awesome, until the year 2000 came and all of a sudden the market started to go down. All of a sudden, I'm not Doogie Hauser. I'm a, that SOB, I can't wait till I see him at the family reunion. Because remember, I'm 19, who are my clients? Mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, you know, my parents and my friends. But fortunately for me, instead of trying to defend the position and tell them to wait it out, I told them between March and May of 2000 to get all of their money out of the market and wait for me to figure out what I was really doing because I just handed the money over to someone else and got paid a commission. One of the hardest things to do in the world is look people in the eye and say, I suck. Not as bad as budgeting, but I suck right now, and you need to do something different. You can either stay with me if you wait, or you can go find someone else. And everyone but one got their money out of the market, and we saved hundreds of thousands of dollars. Would have been millions, but it was, I was 19 and didn't have a lot of money under management, right? So when I'm 22, I walk into a family services firm, which a family services firm means if you're worth $50 million or more, you get what everyone deserves in finance. You walk into these firms and there's a conference table and there's attorneys and there's accountants and there's investment advisors. And the person worth 50 million or more gets to sit down and they actually look out for them and they actually make sure everything's coordinated and they don't end up losing money or overpaying taxes. They don't end up taking too speculative a risk with their money. They're not in mutual funds. This is the way financial planning should be done. And I naively at that moment said, I'm gonna build that for the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur, because I'm an entrepreneur and I'm pissed off that I'm not worth $50 million at this time and I don't get access to this, so I'm going to build that for everyone else. Now, that took like a damn decade to do, by the way. That's hard as hell. Try to find financial professionals that subscribe to the right philosophy of wealth, that are willing to collaborate, that stick to what they're passionate about and not too many things to too many people. And then, you know, we created like a 42-question application. We interviewed them for nine months. They had to do our stuff before we ever let them talk to anyone else. They had to read Killing Sacred Cows and give a report on it because that's when we knew that was like the bullshit test, right? They read that book. Anyone read Killing Sacred Cows in the room? I mean, it's pretty polarizing. If you read it, you either completely subscribe to that or you're completely vehemently opposed to it because I'm basically calling out all the stuff most of us have been taught about finance, like a penny saved is a penny earned. That's penny pinching. You'll get blisters from that. That's no fun. Or, you know, another one would be you're in it for the long haul. When does the long haul end? Anyone know? I mean, I, long haul sounds like I got like a, a wheelbarrow with a bunch of like cinder blocks and I'm running up hills like it's a CrossFit workout or something like that, you know? That doesn't sound fun. The long haul sucks. And the long haul lasts until you die, but then your kids inherit the long haul if you buy into that philosophy. I'm not here to teach you about the long haul. I'm here to make sure you have economic independence. 
You get economic independence because you have your investment income cover your expenses, or you have entrepreneurial income cover your expenses. And what I mean by entrepreneurial income is when you have scale and leverage because other people are operating within your vision, and if you don't show up the next day, there's still income that comes in. Not that you built a job that you're your own boss, but that you built a business. Or the third way is you have a lump sum of money that's enough money that it would if you turned on a little bit of interest with it, it would cover your expenses. That's economic independence. What I mean by getting there is once your expenses are covered, you could swing for the fences in what you're up to. You could play full out in your vision. Money isn't going to be a reason or excuse why you do or don't do something because you now have the basics taken care of. Does that make sense, first of all? The second reason I'm here is, see, when I started my first business, Garrett Gunderson's Car Care, and I went to college, I wanted to go into business. I was in the financial services, and by the time I was a senior in college, I was making more than any of my professors, and I was really getting good at what I do. I wasn't selling the mutual funds and the life insurance stuff. I was helping people save tax, because 93% of business owners overpay on tax. I was helping people save on interest, because pretty much anyone with a loan that didn't have the right credit score and didn't have the right cash flow report is paying too much in interest, which is 80% of people. And all interest is negotiable. That's money where you can save. Or people overpaying on insurance. And not because they chose the gecko geico thing over the caveman or whatever those nonsense commercials are, but simply it's not structured properly. Or hidden fees and commissions and investments. And what I did is I decided to do all the dirty work in finance early on, which no one's paid a commission for the things I'm talking about. Most people in finance, they deal with what they get paid on, which is commissionable products, which is almost always retirement planning. But what if your retirement plan was to retire in your business, not from business? What I mean by retiring in your business is having a business that would be sustainable, even if you didn't show up every single day or every single week. But then if inflation was high, you would change your prices. If taxes went up, as a business, that's one of the best tax shelters you could possibly have right? Or if interest rates are really low with investments, you're earning your money from your business, but you're not a slave to your business. The best way to retire is retire from the things that you hate doing and delegate it to the sick people who love that stuff. <laughs> when I wrote Killing Sacred Cows, the New York Post did this review on it, and they said, yeah, Gunderson's advice is okay, but it doesn't hold up in this one area that if everyone did what they love to do, who would be a garbage man or who would be in charge of the sewers? I was like, that's kind of a valid point, right? I'm like, kids would. That's why we have kids, right? So that we don't have to do those jobs. But, but then in Brigham City, Utah, I met this guy, right? His name's Tom. And Tom was in charge of a sewage plant treatment place. And he loves shit. I don't know what to say. That's just like, I, I, I mean, that's like, he, he was fascinated by it. I'm like, that is a really crappy job, man. I don't, I don't, but I love that you love it, right? So there's this divinity diversity. There's people that love different things. There's people with different abilities. If we all had the same ambition for the exact same things, we wouldn't exchange with one another. We just do everything on our own. So retire from the things you hate and build a life that you love by building the right business. But this is the biggest opportunity I think everyone in this room has. You have a chance to change your financial future and change the financial destiny of any of your heirs moving forward. Because you've chosen to own a business, and if you handle your finances right, which far too many people don't, they hand their money over to someone who sounds smart, and they hope that it's gonna work out. That never changes anyone's financial future. But when I sat down with my grandfather at the age of 22, my, his sister was dying, and they were worried about the government taking all the money, because she was that person, like she was my, poster child for scarcity. And I, I didn't get invited to the funeral because you, apparently when you write bad things about people in books in your family, you're not supposed to do that. I didn't know. I, I mean, I didn't think she would pay for the book, first of all, because she's in scarcity, but apparently someone gave it to her um, out of pride or something. But she actually put money in coffee cans, Folgers coffee cans, and put them in the cellar. And then they buried some of them in the backyard. She applied for welfare and when she applied, they found that she had $500,000 in her bank account. Now, that was the, she, I don't think she ever spent a dollar on anything other than toilet paper. Her entire garage was like stocked with toilet paper in case there was the end of the world. She was going to make sure she was, had a clean butt, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> you know. Maybe she talked to that sewage treatment guy, Tom, and they had some collaboration going on. I'm not quite sure. But see, scarcity really kind of destroyed how she viewed the world and 
So they had all this money set aside, never enjoying it, never living wealthy along the way. But Benjamin Franklin said something I think is worth writing down. Wealth isn't just the man that has it, but the man that lives it. You don't get a second chance to live a first-class lifestyle. And if you're your asset, why not take care of yourself that you enjoy life along the way? One of the you know, attributes of the entrepreneur, and I'm guilty of this, I remember coming home one day, Tom Marf, I'm like, hey, we hit the New York Times and we hit the Inc. 500 this week. And she's like, well, we should celebrate. I'm like, no, it's really, I got a lot going on this week. It's really busy. She's like, really? We're not going to celebrate like a little bit? But that, isn't that like the entrepreneur is like, we're always on to the next thing. And that's like, you got to enjoy the experiences along the way. Take some time off. Don't wear yourself down because you end up having diminishing returns as an individual. You don't, you don't produce as much when you're constantly you know, engaged in something in business all the time. There was a, a leader that once said, hey, the bigger the vision you have, the more you should travel. Right? Because you got to kind of take care of yourself and do things that way. So <laughs> all, this, all this being said, scarcity is budgeting. On the other side, we have what I would call value-based spending in abundance. Value-based spending helps you differentiate between three things, the three measures of worth. The first measure is price. That's what you pay. The second measure is cost. That's the economic benefit or cost. It's like actually measuring it, right? Like I could think of something with a really low price, but a really high cost. I one time in my life, I'm admitting this, like this, I feel like it's an, you know, I'm like an AA admission or something. It's like, I once decided to do Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving with my wife. We got up at 2.30 a.m. People, 2.30 a.m. And I went to Walmart. I mean, it was like, I was so tired, but people were pushing me around and like, like trying to bust down the doors. And my aunt, who's crazy, was fighting someone over the last Christmas tree and pushing them on the ground to save three cents or something. I mean, this is what scarcity does to people. And I bought this thing called a Westinghouse CD player. Anyone remember CD players? Um, yeah, it was 20 bucks. This is why it was a really low price, but really high cost. It worked for about one and a half minutes and then it was done. I had to take all that time to go to the place and be up early in the morning and be just miserable waiting in line to buy this stupid thing. But that's something with a low price but a high cost, right? But there's certain things that have a high price and a low cost. So for example, when you invested in ASM, some of you may have thought that was a high price, but if all of a sudden you make a million dollars, that's a pretty damn low cost, right? You basically got paid to do it. So then the third measure of worth is value. And value is perspective. There's far too many people that were going to try to tell you it's a waste of money to do this or a waste of money to do that based upon their perspective. You should never feel guilt again about paying cash for anything that you really enjoy in life that someone else doesn't value. If you like first class, go for it. You like great clothes, you like great food, you like great wine, don't let someone else judge that for you. That's their perspective. Embrace it. And I'm going to give you a system, which is called a living wealthy account, which the only rule of setting up this account is that you blow the money on whatever you want without any guilt. That's missing from budgeting, isn't it? Yeah, no, I'm not surprised you clapped at that one, right? You're like, yes, tell us, financial guys, spend more money on myself. I love it. This guy's awesome. <laughs> All right, so let's talk cash flow banking. First thing, everyone. Please do this, I beg of you. I want 100,000 people to do this by 2020. You set up a wealth capture account and you just go to your existing bank and set up a separate account from your existing checking or business account. I don't care whether it's a checking, savings, or money market. The interest that you earn on it is insignificant. The thing that it's separate from your other finances is the important aspect. A wealth capture account, this is the opposite of budgeting called cash flow banking. And what the first rule is, you pay yourself first. Is that hard sometimes because you need inventory? Or is that hard sometimes because there's just a million expenses that are coming up in your life, right? If you don't pay yourself first, Parkinson's law sets in. Parkinson's law is that if you have an increase in income, within three to six months, your expenses will rise to meet or exceed that increase. Have you met someone that makes more money now and is in worse financial shape than they've ever been? Not you, obviously, like a neighbor or something, right? Um, <laughs> But that's what happens because of Parkinson's law. So you set up a separate account. I call it a wealth capture account. You can call it a sweep account. But every time you go to make a personal deposit to pay yourself personally, you're going to pay money to that account first. 
and I'm gonna recommend that you get up to 18%. Now, if you can't do that now, I understand. I'm gonna show you where to find the money so it's not all on you. Start with 1%. Just start building the habit. It will make a huge difference. And I'll tell you, it's, it's the only thing that I would say feels a little bit mystical or magical, but if you pay yourself first, you're gonna be amazed how you find the money to make life work. If you'll just try that on. I'm not asking you to fully believe me or completely trust me on that. Just try it on and see what happens. This is especially gonna be important when times are good because has anyone in the room ever spent optimism? Like I just had the most killer month, sold so much stuff on Amazon, it's never gonna end. Next month is gonna be even better. We're getting the boat, I love it. <laughs> and then you're like, what, Chinese New Year? What is that? Like, <laughs> you know. They do have slingshots up here, so I would be careful on the egg segment. Just warning you. I'm gonna, fling, anybody want a water? <laughs> so you set up that separate account. That's your wealth capture account. When you get up to 18% in that account, then you set up a second account called your living wealthy account. And you take 3% of that 15% and you move it over of that 18%. So you leave 15% of the account, 3% moves over to your living wealthy account, and you just go ahead and enjoy that money with one warning. A luxury once enjoyed becomes a necessity. We went to Europe in May and I decided, I've always been a little bit chintzy on the flying. We're like, okay, we're economy comfort to Europe. And we went with the lay down flat beds. And my wife looked at me with her champagne in hand and was like, we going this way next year to Europe, right? I guess so, yeah. Better get that living wealthy account going. But just spend that money guilt free once it hits there because if you don't, then what, you know, you're, you're earning, you're pushing, you're working, but you're not rewarding yourself. And that just becomes, that's like doing a diet where a zero calorie diet. Eventually you're like, I'm going to eat everything in my room right here that is $27 per gummy bear, right? Like that just doesn't work. So don't, don't restrict things from your life from too long. And the other thing is, and this is worth writing down, no one shrinks their way to wealth. No one shrinks their way to wealth. It's all about production and value creation. So set up automation. That's the first part of cash flow banking. And then once the money starts building up in this wealth capture account, see, so I want you to automate your savings, but don't automate your investing. Automated investing is a horrible idea. I just automatically put money in this investment every month, no matter what it does. And then on average, I'll buy high and low, just depending. No, don't automate investing. Automate your savings. Be deliberate with your investing. Now that savings account, you might turn that into a brokerage account, and if you get a brokerage account, you get a line of credit against it. If you get a line of credit against it, you now have access to buy inventory, right? Or you could set it up in a overfunded life insurance policy that has cash value, and you can pull that cash value out anytime you want and use that for inventory. But I want you to start building liquidity because every business that ends up going out of business, even though they have a decent model in business is because they didn't have enough liquidity. Liquidity is underemphasized in the world of finance because no one gets paid on you being liquid. And what I mean by liquid is just enough money in this wealth capture account, all right? Then you start transferring, when you start getting that built up, you can transfer it into a wealth creation account, which would be something that has a line of credit against it, so you can start putting it to use. Have at least six months of your expenses built up in your wealth capture account before you start allocating it to other things but just have that automated pay yourself first so as you have more income, a higher, a higher amount will go in there because the percentage stays the same. Less income, less of a percentage, so it's not about you budgeting. And then once a month, meet with an accountability partner. That might be a spouse, it might be a business partner, it might be a financial person, and just look at are you saving more than you're spending, making sure that you're staying in your parameters. And then you don't have to have envelopes and jars and budget and cut stuff out and you can start enjoying life more along the way. Sound all right? All right. Now, let's move on to the next, the next piece, which is where can we find money for you with your existing assets that currently exist? That's redundant, I get it. Your existing assets that currently exist, right? That's like an Austin Powers moment and you guys were nice enough not to laugh at me at that one, you know? I always, I always tell my wife I want to be a comedian, and she always tells me there's no shot in hell that I could be a comedian. And I said, no, when I speak at events, people laugh. She goes, they think you're going to make them money, so they're just giving you a courtesy. Yeah. She really says this. She, she did, 
in Europe, I did tell some jokes in a room of people I didn't know, and people asked, she says, you might actually have a shot, never to make money, but to actually entertain people for a few moments that don't know anything about you making them money. So I've made a little bit of progress, that's a big deal. So the first place to look for money and really improve cash flow is just comb through any loan you have and find your top interest rates. If you're paying a higher interest rate on any loan than you're earning with any investment, cash out that investment and pay off the loan. It'll immediately improve your cash flow, improve your credit score, and we can now start renegotiating and better interest rates everywhere else. The second thing, if you hate debt and you don't want to be in debt, don't make the mistake of shortening your loans. You're in business. Business means cash flow is going to ebb and flow. The last thing you want to do is force yourself into a higher payment on any single loan. If anything, you want to extend your loans to a longer period because if you have the cash, you can always pay it off. You could even choose to pay more. But if you force yourself into a higher payment, number one, it lowers your credit score. And by lowering your credit score, it might hurt every interest rate you get on every other loan or you might get denied a loan if you need a line of credit for inventory. So now that you, you know, as you're in business, manage your cash flow carefully. Calculate your cash flow. Do everything you can to improve your cash flow and nothing to hurt your cash flow. Even if that means, like sometimes when people, and the best marketing the banks ever do is they say, this is a 30-year mortgage. And people think, oh my God, I have to have this mortgage for 30 years. And we have a 10-year mortgage. Oh, that's good. That's only 10 years. But did you know, there's a big secret, you could pay off a 30-year mortgage in seven years. There's nothing forcing you to wait 30 years, but there's an emotional trigger there. And did you know that a bank can sell a 15-year mortgage? Anyone ever had a mortgage and then all of a sudden it was a different company 30 days later or a year later? Because they sell those. And do you know they can sell a 15-year mortgage for a lot more than they can a 30-year mortgage? Because banks are really good at managing cash flow. They're looking for cash to come in. So they want you to have higher payments. Make the lowest payments you possibly can. We use something called a cash flow index. You take your loan, you divide it by the minimum monthly payment, and it spits out a number. If the number is less than 50, you have a cash hog on your hands. You have something that's requiring a high payment in relationship to a low balance. You want to restructure those or eliminate those. If you have a car loan or a car that's paid off, you could refinance a car loan and get a really low interest rate, usually like 2.9% and pay off higher interest rate credit cards. Just look at your cash flow and start thinking from a cash flow perspective with every single loan that you have. Does this make sense? Is that practical stuff everyone can go look at and they can go implement and they could do? So amending returns. I, every three years, I have a second set of eyes look at my taxes. Sometimes it's a tax attorney, sometimes it's a CPA, even though I have my normal financial team. And in 2009, I found $54,000 that even I missed in the damn financial world. There's 77,000 pages in the U.S. alone that these attorneys and accountants have to navigate through to save on tax. So 93% of you are probably overpaying on tax. The second thing is, he was making great money in business and didn't set up a corporation. Can you believe that? Let's shame him right now. Oh. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was odd. I love these guys. Like, I, you know, I wish I had more time. No, uh, just kidding. Uh, so we set up a corporation, and did you know, like, one of the cool things as a business owner, you can reclassify your income. Most people just take a salary. That's the highest tax possible. But if you could take a dividend or you can turn something into a capital gain, then that's what we did for him, and that saved another 10000 a year. 20,000. I mean, I'm trying to be conservative here and not make everybody think we're going to be magic. We don't save everyone these kind of numbers, right? But $20,000 a year by setting up a corporation doing that, and he owned a physical business, so we were able to give him three times the tax deductions on something called cost segregation. I want to make sure, just like when I sat down with my grandfather, when his sister was in the hospital, and things are not going well, and they think she's going to die, and he says, what are we going to do? Because we think the government's going to take this money, and it's really my money, my sister's, and this one that's dying. So the three siblings, but there's this Italian family where the one didn't get married, took care of her mom, and the other, you know, others were arranged marriage, so it's just like the money stayed in her account. I figured out a way to protect it so it didn't go away. And then my grandpa, who like is my hero, like the person that I just love so much in life, he just looks at me, and you know, he's the first person I knew that was even an entrepreneur. He had two side businesses, even though he's a coal miner. One was he played the accordion and would travel and play in you know, all these different locations and do band stuff. So I, I was in a band and played guitar. I really suck at it, so don't ask me to play. But um, the other thing he did was he's a TV repairman. And so I thought it was so cool that he owned a business, and I learned a little bit about business from him. I'd ride in his red van and everything, and we'd go to little you know, TV repair appointments, and I would touch the TV and get shocked when he told me not to because that's what kids do. But 
he was kind of worried about me because I think he wanted to hand the baton down to me to be like a patriarch for the family because that's one thing as this Italian man, he was like all about bringing the family together. And when he kind of saw his mortality with his sister dying, we're having this conversation and he wanted to protect things. He's like, when are you going to get a job? Right? And I was disappointed to hear that. And I was like, and I think it was the most depressed I've ever been in my life was the moment he said that and I was graduating college and I was offered a job for Merrill Lynch from Strong Investments, which was the number two mutual fund family in the world at the time. Arthur Anderson, we know what that happened to them, uh, an investment bank. So my top four job offers, one company got acquired and the other companies are pretty much non-existent. But that's what they thought was gonna be financial security for me. And they wanted it for the family, right? But I made the choice to do what I do today and say no to going and getting a nine to five job, which I could have done, and instead invested and gambled on myself, right? I remember I was confronted with the five-year-old note carton incident, like thinking, man, am I stupid by not taking this job? But I will tell you this, I did that, and not a day went by for the rest of my grandfather's life that when we talked, he didn't get teary-eyed, and he didn't tell me how damn proud he was of me, and how much difference it made for this family, what we're up to and what we can contribute, and you have the chance to do the same. Make sure you get your finances in order. Make sure you focus on your business and don't let anyone else sway you or tell you or get you into that other world of a nine to five because you too could be part of that people that have a $5 million net worth if you execute, if you learn, and if you build the right team around you. It's all about a team. Find the best questions you can ask us and those around you because those are the people that get the best answers and they get access to the most wealth in this world. Don't be afraid to not have the right answer in the moment and to ask that question. Too many people put on a show like everything's perfect. I've made mistakes in investing. I owned 100 real estate properties, even though I hate real estate, right? Just because I thought that's what you're supposed to do and that's what every guru said. I believe that you invest in something that you know about, something that's close to your core competencies, to your core drivers, and your overall focus. And diversification is never gonna make you wealthy. Focus is what makes you wealthy. Andrew Carnegie said, I put all my eggs in one basket and watch it like a hawk. And that's how you're gonna get wealthy is focus, don't diversify. Don't listen to the masses and all the information out there. Most financial people teach the middle class and the poor people the rules to stay in the poor and the middle class. The rules for the wealthy is you invest in yourself, you treat yourself as the greatest asset, you invest only in alignment with your investor DNA, you look and put everything into the things that you know about and nothing outside of that, and then you just let go of the noise when everyone else tells you you're crazy because that's the only way that you get wealthy and you make an impact in this world is just to be crazy enough to face your future with confidence when everyone else is cowering because of fear. Want to master your money? Want to figure out the things that you could do to improve your finances? Click here and check out more videos like this on Money Matters.